Good morning and welcome to the sixth meeting of 2018 of the Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform Committee. I want to remind everyone present to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as these may affect the broadcasting system. We have apologies today from our uh, colleague Claudia Beamish. The first item on the agenda is for the committee to consider whether to take item three in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. We are agreed. The second item on the agenda is to take evidence on stage one of the Crown Estate uh, Bill. The first evidence session is to hear from Scottish Government officials on the background and content of the Bill. Can I therefore welcome David Mallon, Head of Crown Estate Strategy Unit of Marine Scotland, Mike Palmer, the Deputy Director of the Aquaculture, Crown Estate, Recreational Fisheries, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, European Division of Marine Scotland. That's quite a title. Um, Douglas Kerr, solicitor with the Scottish Government as legal director. Gentlemen, good morning. Um, let's kick this off by looking at the duties in section seven of the bill. Can I ask how uh, you think those might make a difference to the way in which the Crown Estate assets are managed? Yes, uh, good morning. and. Uh, and I'll perhaps uh, kick off by outlining uh, what Scottish Minister's uh, policy perspective on that is, and um, perhaps uh, my uh, legal colleague uh, Douglas Kerr could add if there's anything else that, uh, that is worthy uh, to, 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 to say. Um, I think the first thing to highlight is that um, this is a kind of uh, a reform of the duty that exists in the Crown Estate Act 1961, uh, which requires the manager to, uh, to maintain and enhance the value of the estate and the return obtained from it, but with due regard to the requirements of good management. Um, and the reference to good management uh, was never actually defined and has sometimes been interpreted as requiring good stewardship and other times has been, has, has been interpreted as to include the ability to take account of other factors. And I think there are some examples of the Crown Estate Commissioners in the past and Crown Estate Scotland currently uh, stepping into that, that second um, interpretation at a smaller scale. Uh, but I think there's always been on the part of the existing managers um, a wariness about the, the legal vires uh, to do that. Uh, and therefore, um, Scottish ministers, when thinking about what the long-term framework for the management of the Crown Estate in Scotland, uh, the Scottish Crown Estate, uh, should be, um, the uh, Scottish ministers wish to make it more um, explicit that um, these wider factors, uh, the economic, the social and the environmental benefits that can arise from decision making can properly be taken into account. So um, we would expect that through this uh, more explicit um, you know, ability that uh, a manager uh, will be more encouraged and in fact will be careful to take account of those opportunities before reaching final decisions. Particularly focus on the environmental well-being aspect, because if, if one considers the role of the Crown Estate in leasing seabed for activities such as salmon farming or um, offshore wind turbines, as, as I would interpret it at the moment, the Crown Estate performs that duty with a view to generating income, but it takes no account of the environmental impacts of salmon farming or those relating to offshore wind farms, and we've had some contention around those in the east coast of Scotland. So how will this be different, or will it be different at all in future? Well, I think the, the, the short answer is we do have to kind of wait and see how managers do use that new discretion. But also to try and add to, to that, um, the, the existing decision making on the part of the of the manager of Crown Estate assets um, sits within a wider context of, you know, licensing by government for um, for activities to take place, etc. So, um, I, I think there's already, you know, a, a fair amount of environmental assessment that takes place before any activity can take place in the sea. The Crown Estate lease is providing uh, the ability for um, a, an actor in the, uh, to um, to secure uh, the. You know, the kind of uh, exclusive use of a space. Uh, but I think over time, I think with these new duties, there will be uh, an increased spotlight placed upon the uh, environmental and the social um, and, and the wider economic consequences of that more narrow um, return that can be obtained from the lease to the, to the Crown Estate. Pressure on this, though. I'm, I'm trying to get an understanding about what 
purpose is served by adding environmental well-being in here. I welcome it, but I'm not quite understanding what difference this makes, because at the moment we're essentially relying on Marine Scotland, SNH, whoever, to consider the environmental, in, environmental impacts of these activities. What, what duty does this place specifically on the Crown Estate? I think we have to look at Section 7 in, in the context also of Section 11. Now, Section 11 is about you know, transactions like sales and leasing, um, and up until now it's been a very much a kind of market, uh, you know, kind of best consideration, uh, uh, focused pro profit maximisation for uh, the Crown Estate. That um, Section 11 also contains uh, reforms which uh, open out the possibility of the wider factors being taken into account, and therefore I think we could view um, section 11, uh, section 7, I should say, sorry, on the part of Scottish ministers, they wish to see across the whole um, range of activity of the Crown Estate that consideration uh, for you know, the social, environmental and, envir uh, and, and economic in, in the wider sense. And so, you know, without section 7, we'd be reliant only on section 11 when it comes to transactions rather than the, the whole ethos of how the, the organisation is, is operating. So could you envisage a situation perhaps in future where the Crown Estate, before it uh, allows the lease of the seabed, engaging with the other agencies to see if there are any concerns around the environment, for example, before it enters into an arrangement? Yes, um, I, I think, to be fair um, to Crown Estate Scotland, that a lot of that discussion does already happen. Um, uh, there's also the, the, the context of, in, in the the decision making that you refer to, uh, convener, the, uh, the, the the presence of the National Marine Plan, which sets that context and gives um, you know a direction for all um, uh, consenters, uh, including uh, uh, Crown Estate Scotland or a future manager of Crown Estate assets. Um, and but over and above that, I think this should provide uh, even more explicit um, uh, uh, requirements for a manager to to look uh, upfront at the extent to which these wider factors will play out, not just the, the return to the Scottish Crown Estate. Yeah, okay. uh, Mike Palmer, perhaps you want to come in, because I'm yeah. interested in how you see this interaction. Yeah, if I may just add, I, 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 think, uh, I, I think these extra duties and, and, and powers that are placed um, uh, on local managers um, are part of the overall balance that Scottish ministers will wish to see um, uh, uh, developing in terms of the management of the, of, of, of the Scottish Crown Estate. So... There is an ethos of encouraging greater and stronger local stewardship of assets, um, a greater community empowerment. But alongside greater community empowerment, there is a wish from Scottish ministers to ensure that um, due consideration is taken of these wider um, uh, societal benefits that uh, local managers should be seeking to pursue and to achieve. So up to now, it's been a very co commercial ethos, if you like. Um, uh, that's been pursued by the Crown Estate Commissioners and Scottish Ministers are seeking to broaden that out as part of the kind of trade-off, if you like, between uh, local empowerment and uh, uh, le letting go some of that national management down to local level. Okay. Uh, John Scott, Mark Roscoe and Alex Rowley want to come in. So, John Scott. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, and so, if we move to this new ethos... Um, then, as you said previously, the machine, had it been there, essentially to produce yield on assets. Um, so there'll be a, a loss of focus on that objective. And so how would you expect this to reduce the yield on the assets, given this change in focus and direction? And how much would you expect the yield to be reduced by, given the tightness of the Scottish budget? The, the, there is a primary duty in, in, in the bill to um, uh, increase the value of the assets. Um, and uh, there is a response... Sorry? How will you measure value then? Well, there, there, there is a, um, uh, a reference to seeking to uh, achieve market value, um, uh, uh, which is... Um, uh, uh, clearly understood as a term uh, and uh, has um, uh, is is defined in in in, in, in the commercial world um, as a concept 
So that is, a, um, uh, that is written into the bill to seek to um, achieve market value, except in certain circumstances, which again are defined in the bill. Um, and uh, so there is that primary duty um, on local managers to, to pursue uh, uh, market value, to increase the, the value of the overall assets. Um, uh, so that isn't being lost um, uh, in any way. There is a balance, however, to be struck uh, in, in, in the eyes of Scottish ministers with these other um, considerations around um, social, environmental um, uh, considerations. Uh, and therefore, it's about achieving a balance between those two, uh, but not losing sight of either one, if you like. Therefore, to sort of pin you down on this, would you expect to yield from these assets to reduce as a result of this new focus? I think our, our overall expectation would be that the... the um, Crown Estate as, a, as an entity um, uh, overall, a, a set of assets overall, that, that we would expect the yield to be rising because that also would be of benefit to Scotland. Um, and Scottish Minister's intentions are that um, across all of these elements, across the economic sphere, across the environmental and social spheres, that there should be benefit accruing to Scotland from the way in which the Crown Estate in Scotland is managed. Um, uh, so we, so we, Scottish ministers would not wish to lose sight of that financial benefit alongside the others. So we would, so Scottish ministers would uh, be expecting to see the overall yield um, being protected and rising indeed. Thank you. But presumably some of that overall yield would not be coming to Scottish ministers, it would be going to local authorities. There, 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 there have been commitments made, indeed, for um, uh, part of the, the yield from those assets to, to, to go to local managers. Yeah. Thank you. Mark Roscoe. I mean, given the, these new objectives around uh, the environment and social well-being, I'm just wondering how that could change the relationship with the regulator. Um, so, for example, you, you look at SEPA um, currently undertaking a sector review of salmon farming, uh, bringing forward uh, new regulations. My impression is Crown State Scotland have been only very loosely involved in that. And so would you see going forward a, a different relationship with the regulator, perhaps a tighter relationship? How, how would you anticipate that changing? Um, I have um, lots of discussion with Crown State Scotland and other regulators as well. And my sense there is already a, a lot of dialogue that does take place. You know, there's. You know, there's a, a, a partnership approach to kind of uh, many kind of um, activities on the part of kind of public sector uh, uh, within Scotland. Uh, around the margins, there may be kind of uh, new discussions that take place, but I, I think the, the relationships are already there. But I think my point is that we haven't really seen Crown Estate Scotland embedded into some of those processes, particularly around regulatory reform. Would you expect that to change or, or not? Do you think the level of engagement that Crown Estate Scotland currently has, say, with SEPA over a sector such as <coughs> salmon farming is adequate, or would you expect that to increase as a result of these new objectives coming in? Um, as I said, there, there's already involvement by Crown Estate Scotland in, in, in a lot of initiatives. Uh, it could increase, I think, as people understand that Crown Estate Scotland is, is here as an interim manager, then they may be more involved in uh, directly in discussions. I think what change we can anticipate through the bill uh, proposals uh, and the implementation of them is that there are more managers uh, and there are more kind of discussions that, uh, that, uh, that could be had with regulators on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, and as uh, my colleague said, there's a, a wish to kind of balance the kind of local discretion with a, a national framework and the, the strategic plan we see as being a means uh, by which uh, the, there can be an outline of kind of uh, strategic intentions and there can be a way in which regulators and in, a, in an efficient way can have that dialogue with the manager of Crown Estate assets in Scotland. Um, and, uh, and over and above that, there may also be specific initiatives that... Uh, that uh, managers could get involved in. 
And I think we just have to wait and see. It is quite difficult to, to see. There isn't really a blueprint um, on what the, the future looks like because there isn't yet full knowledge of the local ambitions for management of Crown Estate assets. And, um, you know, with the best one in the world, I think everyone would like to see the manager of a Scottish Crown Estate asset involved in those types of discussions. But I think we start from um, a fairly kind of uh, good foundation and the question is how much more is needed um, as, as, the, as the, the, the changes uh, play out. There about the, the new discretion, social and environmental good. What I'm wondering is um, where the final decisions on, on, on the social and environmental good uh, are, are made. So, so if you take the example the convener gave about, about um, salmon farming, let's say Shetland Council, Shetland Islands Council has control over the waters and decide on environmental grounds not to allow uh, an application for a salmon farm to, to go ahead. Is that their final decision or could that operator lobby Scottish ministers? Uh, so, so where does the power actually lie? Is it with the, the devolved local managers or is, it, is, it, is there some kind of process where it can be overruled? The power does lie with the manager. There's uh, you know, the, the duty that they have to um, have regard to uh, and there's the discretion that they can choose to, um, to take account of. Um, at the end of the day, they'll have to, you know, be, to be able to defend their decisions. And it also is, is a decision that isn't taken in isolation. It sits within the, the, the wider context of uh, the regulatory framework that exists in Scotland, including you know, the you know, regulations that, uh, that, uh, that govern uh, the environment uh, and also you know, the, the context for decision making, like the National Marine Plan in the case of the example you give. And also, as I mentioned, the strategic plan that uh, is, is contained within the bill for the, the wider and longer term approach to the management of the assets should set a context for the manager. And they would also have to, through the bill, have regard to that strategic plan. So local discretion. But um, there, ha there are some kind of uh, context to, to that decision making that are provided for through the wider regulatory framework and uh, policies uh, and legislation, as well as this, this, uh, this bill. And I, I, I might add that um, in, in terms of um, uh, your, your question about where the power lies, um, the, the bill is drafted in such a way as um, to give um, ministers the discretion to decide on a case-by-case -case basis um, uh, uh, whether a transfer should be made um, to a local manager. And um, there will be a very careful process of consultation and scrutiny of proposals um, uh, that will be brought by the local manager for the way in which they wish to manage that asset, um, which would um, uh, uh, um, be undertaken before any decisions were making were made to um, uh, make that transfer to the local manager. So there would be checks and balances, if you like, put in place uh, in order to make sure that a very considered decision was taken by Scottish ministers um, on a case-by-case -case basis before the transfer was made. Uh, can I just take you back, to, uh, uh, Mr Palmer, to your answer to John Scott about what was envisaged in terms of income generation? Um, in the financial memorandum, there is a speculation uh, around the range of possible financial costs to the Scottish Government, where it suggests that there is a potential, and I stress potential, for a drop in income around local authority ports and non-operational ports and jetties. And it speculates that the range would be zero to medium, which over a five-year period is put at anywhere between two to ten million pounds. So there does appear to be an anticipation of the possibility of uh, a drop in revenue from one aspect um, of the, the current income. Given that's the case, do you still hold to the view that overall the expectation is that there will be an increase in income? Um, yeah, I, I think Scottish ministers would... Um overall um, envisage 
um, there to be uh, substantial opportunity uh, for the overall value of the estate to rise. So there may be some elements of the estate um, which would not be expected to return um, as much in the short or medium term as other elements, but uh, there are other opportunities, for example, um, offshore in the marine environment where it is, it is felt that there are, um, uh, uh, that's quite a high likelihood that, that one could quite significantly increase the revenues um, from the overall estate. Clearly, it's not something that we can guarantee or, or know exactly how that will pan out in the future. Um, but uh, the, the current indicators are that... Wind is an obvious one, but that's dependent on the UK government's attitude towards um, financial support. But John Scott, do you want to come in on that? I'm intrigued by this concept that income will fall in some areas and therefore other areas will have to work harder and income will be greater for all those other areas. Would you care to be more specific? Are you talking about rents of, of properties, of, of farm rents, or, or what are you expecting? Where is the income expected to rise in that regard, given that others will fall? I'll, I'll, I'll refer uh, uh, to, to David here on the, the detail. You made the statement. <laughs> um, uh, but just, to, just in very general terms, um, I, I, I guess it's almost a statement of fact that there, there will be some assets which... Uh, which could be expected in any one year, indeed, to, to deliver more revenue than others. Um, and uh, that, that's something that it's, it, it's not um, possible to, to, to predict with total accuracy from one year to the next, um, uh, and uh, is often dependent on, on, on the wider economic context within which one is managing the estate. Um, so that's... Plan. Forgive me for asking such a blunt question, but is there a business plan for the for the furtherance and the development of this project? Or yeah, is it Crown, just Crown Estate possible? Scotland um, in, interim management, um, which, which is the current national manager, um, uh, uh, has um, yes has, has a business plan and uh, a forward strategy for managing the estate. Clearly, as we move um, to the legislation and into a period where there's the potential to uh, uh, transfer down to a local level, then the, the overall dynamic of the, of, of the management of the assets will change. And then we will be looking at individual business plans uh, uh, and, and, and strategies drawn up by local managers. But at the moment, um, yes, there is a, a national level um, uh, uh, planning regime in place. I don't know, David, if you wanted to. Go ahead, please. Yes, um, I was just going to kind of um, try and add by um, saying that um, I think uh, Mike was uh, looking at it in both dimensions. The first dimension being you know, the, the, the more narrow return to the, the Scottish Crown Estate from a transaction, but also the second dimension being like a kind of national accounting framework. And when we think about the duties that would apply to a manager, they would be, you know, uh, the default would be a commercial approach unless they can demonstrate that um, those wider benefits uh, can be expected to accrue. And where those wider benefits accrue, um, it's tolerable in a kind of national sense to, um, to experience a, a reduction in, in that income, even though the fiscal framework, you know, accounting, you know, uh, resulted in there being an overall reduction to the Scottish block. Uh, that reduction in the revenue obtained or the capital obtained uh, uh, could be expected to be accompanied by wider benefits that will accrue to, to um, Scotland as a whole. So overall, um, there should be, you know, um, a, 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 at least a, a neutral or favourable position. And if I may add, in the business and uh, in the, the financial memorandum, um, the, the the scenario that is contained there is. Uh, painting a range from no change, which could be how managers choose to, um, to kind of uh, run the, and manage the assets to the, to the scenario where there's a move to, you know, the maximum is where effectively there's no charge uh, and, and no revenue equivalent to what is obtained at, at present, so zero revenue. So I think probably the truth lies somewhere in between, but until, you know, uh, managers have the ability to, uh, follow their kind of um, 
own priorities locally within that national context with precise you know, uh, changes in the, the existing income level are, are quite difficult to predict. Have projections been made at all or not really? We have um, through the, the work on the business and regulatory impact assessment for the consultation paper and also building on that through the financial memorandum um, looked at the, you know, the, the, the potential consequences over the next five years and, uh, and looked at the various scenarios um, and, uh, and underlying that are uh, some assumptions and quite a lot of work that we've done with our finance uh, colleagues and with um, the uh, and, and with our economists and with um, stakeholders as well. Thanks very much. Donald Cameron. Can I, uh, refer Can I just be absolutely uh, clear? Um, when we talk about management of an asset, uh, to what extent does the revenue accrue to the manager and to what extent does it remain with the Crown Estate? Okay, um, if I can try and cover this one and, and by all means add if, uh, if, there's, if I've missed anything but there's the, the, the manager is responsible for the management of that asset and uh, revenue generated, the gross revenue would be received by the, the manager uh, and from that gross revenue the, the management of that asset and the costs associated with it will be paid for by uh, the manager. Uh, the the surplus, if there is a surplus at the end of the year, would be paid, is required to be paid into the Scottish Consolidated Fund. Okay, so in the hypothetical situation where you have, say, a wind farm on one of the Crown Estates, estates and um, the, perhaps the local community council uh, wants to be the manager, uh, but also at the same time the local authority wants to be the manager, uh, and there is a significant income net income involved, how, how is that resolved? How, how do you foresee this bill um, putting in place a framework for a resolution of a potential dispute such as that? Well, I think the dispute that you mentioned, if, correct me if I'm wrong, is to do with who should be the manager, whether it is the community or the local authority. And I think that is you know, uh, not impossible to foresee that there is some kind of level of uh, difference or, or of opinion. Uh, we would hope, uh, Scottish ministers would hope that uh, through them a, a kind of due process for implementation of the bill, that those issues uh, could be resolved at an early stage in terms of who is the manager. Um, in fact, you know, as part of the implementation plan, um, rather than just um, await, you know, ad hoc um, um, in, uh, proposals from individual kind of um, organisations. I, I think uh, Scottish ministers are currently contemplating the value of um, the, a phased approach uh, and uh, a process that could involve um, seeking uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, views from uh, communities over and above and from local authorities over and above those that have expressed a view to date uh, on their ambition to manage assets and there can be a considered view as to who in any one circumstance is best placed uh, to, uh, to take on management. But then as management um, is decided, then there are some duties that apply to a manager like the production of a management plan to outline intentions over how the assets will be managed, proposed sales, um, the, 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 uh, etc. Um, and uh, and I, I would expect at a practical level there to be quite a lot of um, uh, contributions to that manager over, over what should be in that plan so that there is at, at a kind of second uh, order the ability to, to manage those potential differences in, in, in opinions between different parties. Kate Forbes. Uh, continuing that theme of uh, revenue um, generation, in 2015, the First Minister stated that coastal and island communities will benefit from 100% of the net revenue generated in their area from activities within 12 miles of the shore. Now, you may have touched on this earlier, but what is the current thinking on the arrangements for the distribution of net revenue um, for marine assets out to 12 nautical miles to coastal and island councils? Um, we're in discussion with COSWA about the mechanics of, um, of implementing that uh, commitment. Uh, 
I think the starting point is that even as we speak with the with and even though the devolution of the management uh, has been secured, we don't yet have a set of audited accounts for for Scotland, let alone you know the the assets at a more uh, local level. And that set of accounts will only be available at the end of this financial year, and one, uh, once it's produced and finalised by China State Scotland and uh, and uh, and then audited uh, by the Auditor General, uh, then that provides you know the you know the the reference point for what the net revenue is. Uh, and the discussions with COSWA um, have been uh, dis uh, looking at um, a way in which uh, the, there can be a, an allocation based upon that amount to individual local authorities, probably on an interim basis, given that you know, this will be the first um, set of accounts. If, uh, presumably, based on your earlier answer to Donald Cameron, it would only be if the local authority was the manager that those uh, that revenue would go directly to coastal and island councils. Uh, not uh, in the initial phase, because um, Crown Estate Scotland for the year just going past is obviously you know the, the manager, um, and kind of in a broader sense, I think that commitment uh, uh, recognised um, the the. The point being made that uh, there's uh, there's kind of, uh, some benefit that should be accrued from the the presence of these activities taking place on the assets adjacent to the the, you know, the population concerns. So the uh, ministers so far have sought to draw a distinction between the, the management and the revenue, so that uh, we don't have to wait until the management is, set, is settled before. Uh, local communities can benefit from the, 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 the revenue that's been generated. Irrespective of the manager, um, local um, councils, coastal councils will benefit from 100% of the revenue, net revenue rather. Uh, yes, uh, in the sense that irrespective, if I could just slightly rephrase that, uh, 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 if that's all right. Uh, so irrespective of the manager, we want uh, coastal communities to benefit, uh, and the interim arrangements, you know, would be um, uh, through the, the local authorities. Now, as as um, management changes, and we perhaps have a, a mix of community organisations and local authorities, I think the unanswered question is whether um, it is correct that local authorities should only be the beneficiaries of that that income as as the whole system develops, or or whether there's a a, 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 a need to kind of reappraise the, the way in which the, the the money ultimately reaches a community. Um, just following on from that, where there are councils, take Highland Council for example, which has some islands, but the future should look like and and. In terms of use of the the, the, the powers in, in the bill that exists for ministers, but also potentially in other areas that aren't private areas. And then thirdly, uh, the bill includes um, powers uh, for ministers or Crown Estate Scotland to uh, to provide support costs for the the transition of a, an organisation wanting to be a manager to become a manager or a delegate for that matter as well. So I'm right in thinking that you actually will and power groups will be prepared to look at any proposals, legal ones by the way, uh, that will increase assets or encourage community groups within the local areas, yes? Yeah, I mean, any reasonable request needs to be properly kind of uh, um, and assessed and, you know, a, 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 a decision uh, taken. So uh, there's the ability, I mean, I, I think the Cabinet Secretary has made it clear she's very interested in community organisations that are in, uh, that wish to, uh, you know, uh, take on uh, 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 management of one or, or more of the assets. And we're also kind of uh, uh, in discussion with Community Land Scotland and other organisations about, you know, how we can... Uh, disseminate, you know, what the bill um, enables, and uh, and um, and how um, um, organisations can express an interest. And the pilots, I think, will, and hopefully the parliamentary scrutiny process will be important in raising the the profile of of this uh, the, this set of issues. Thank you, gentlemen. I think that's been a useful scene setter uh, for the work we're about to undertake. Um, at its next meeting on the 27th of February, the committee will take evidence from Paul Wheelhouse on the Electricity Works Environmental Impact Assessment Scotland Amendment Regulations, SSI 2017-451. 
It will also consider its draft report to the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee on its inquiry into the environmental impacts of salmon farming and consider its approach to future work on the marine environment. Uh, as agreed earlier, we'll now move into private session. I ask that the public gallery is cleared as the public part of the meeting is concluded.